Hello, everybody. It's Dr. T here on Tuesday night for our Tuesday night live. And we are, uh, we're backing up. We're at the back end of November to talk about fertility nutrition. That's been the theme of our month. I've unofficially labeled this nutrition, fertility nutrition month. And we are going to be joined by amazing accredited dietitian Nick Nation from Nutrition Nation. You can find him on Google, Nutrition Nation. Uh, you can also find him on Insta and Facey. Uh, so make sure you go and look for him. Um, and I'm just waiting for him to jump on so that I can connect with him here, show my Insta prowess, my live prowess. Have you come on yet? Make sure you let me know you're here, Nick. Ask to join. <laughs> How are you guys? You good? I uh, didn't have an opportunity to get on live last week. I literally just got back from Belgium. What a whirlwind tour! Did you see my? Um, did you see my waffle picture? <laughs> I found that I was walking along some random cobblestone street in the middle of Brussels and was admiring all the chocolates in the window and all the waffle making. And then I came across the, uh, the manica piece, the little man doing a wee. Um, and right next to the manica piece, if you look him up, he's quite a famous statue in Belgium. Uh, right next to him was a waffle shop that made waffles in the shape of penises and vulvas and a chocolate manica piece. Was, um, I was kind of looking around at everybody <laughs> seeing if anyone was actually eating one in public. Uh, I couldn't quite bring myself to it. In fact, I was very proud of myself. I did not have a waffle, a Belgian waffle, a Belgian chocolate or a Belgian beer while I was over there, but I did bring them all home with me. So um, I'm looking forward to the end of my health challenge in a couple of weeks and I'll be able to enjoy one or two. Now, where are you, Nick Nation? I'm hoping that you'll be getting on really shortly. How are you guys? I hope you've had an okay week. If there are any sort of fertility nutri nutrition questions that you would like Nick to answer, um, why don't you pop them into the chat? Again, same rules apply. Don't tell us your life story. Keep it nice and generic. And as they flick up on the screen, once he gets on, I will make sure that I... Um, Jules K T eight. You can't be in my live video. <laughs> I need Nick, Nick to be in my live video. Oh dear. <clears throat> so yeah, if you guys have got any questions, and I can always see if I can answer stuff as we go. So Nick, uh, just by way of introduction, Nick actually works with me at um, at Womb. He has worked. Uh, in our multidisciplinary team now since since womb opened in 2020 uh, and he has worked in the area of as an accredited dietitian for much much longer than that i'll let him tell you a little bit about himself um, but there are two particular areas which he has had incredible success with and that is in the area of um, PCOS and he's got an amazing PCOS program that he's going to tell you a little bit about and also in the management of uh, how diet can contribute to the management of, of endometriosis. Oh, he's finally here. Finally. All right, Nick, I am going to hang on a sec, see if I can add you. Let me see. Ask to be added. Excellent. Nick Nutrition Nation, I need to add you. Mm -hmm. Can you ask to be added? Because I'm obviously rubbish at this. <laughs> How come I did it so well previously? Oh, that's okay, Jules. Kate. <laughs> did I say that right? That's all right. No worries. Maybe you can show Nick how to do it. How to, how to rest quest to add himself because I'm just trying to add him in here and it's not giving me that option. So Nick, can you just request to add, please, so that I can bring you on? Because I don't know how to do it. <clears throat> mm. 
Maybe if I add as moderator. No, that's not going to work. It says I should be able to add you to the live. But if you just request to be added, a little tan came up when I joined that said send request to add. Oh, maybe I can press this. No. Invite to join. Here we go, Nick. Invite. So, Nick, you have to uh, accept my invite. Yay! Yay! <laughs> it, it, it shows we're both over 40, mate. <laughs> <laughs> I have no oh, idea how to do that. Goodness gracious. So, while we were waiting for you, there's been a few questions added, but tell you what, we'll leave questions to the end. Um, so we might launch straight into it. I want you to just give everybody a little bit about your history and how you came to this point uh, of uh, your interest in fertility nutrition. Have you got all night? <laughs> <laughs> no, you have literally two minutes. <laughs> okay, two minutes. I was in a shower in Bolivia and I thought, I want to be a dietitian. Um, and then I went and studied, became, was a, ba ba lula, a baby dietitian. Uh, for a while, I was I was more generalist, so I would see anything or anyone from um, heart disease, diabetes, pregnancy, breastfeeding, cancer, and everything in between. Um, and then I got hold of this thing called epigenetics, um, and I realised that through epigenetics, I could actually help couples trying to conceive. And, and therefore influence the health of their children and the next generation. Um, so it's just like, it's mind boggling how, what mum and dad, or even before their mum and dad, what mum and dad can do in the three months before conception in terms of lifestyle factors like diet, exercise, sleep, stress, etc., and how that can have such a profound influence on the health of the child before they even exist. Yeah. It's amazing, isn't it? Before I actually got onto the training program, and it just blew my mind that that nine months in the womb, or even shorter, you know, the fact that some babies are born preterm, mm. imprints on them how their health is going to look like for the rest of their life. Like, it's incredible, that whole yeah. concept. And the fact that somebody even came up with that is even amazing. So that's... I, just... I, I love it. And I love the fact that... Um, you are part of the journey with all of our patients uh, in the fertility space and at womb. So I thought, and, you know, everyone loves a story, right? I thought it would be great if you could perhaps share a couple of success stories that you have had with the patients who have come through, you know, fertility or reproductive medicine. So I'm just going to hand over to you and let you tell everybody about some of your success stories. Oh, I tell you what, like job satisfaction like 10 out of 10 when somebody comes to me for nutrition advice because they're trying to conceive, they've tried everything else. Perhaps they've even, uh, they've even gone through multiple IVF rounds, spent thousands of dollars and well, expended so much energy, so much emotion and stress involved in the whole process to, to then come out of it with a, a beautiful, healthy baby. And then they email me and let me know about it. And I'm like, this is why I do what I do. It's Good so feeling. cool. Oh yeah, yeah, I'm on a high after after a um, a catch up like that, or or when I hear that kind of news. Um, success stories. All right. So yeah, if there's uh, I don't want to boast, but there's been plenty. Yeah, of you them. can just go. For it. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think. One really good IVF one that, that really springs to mind straight away. The journey was amazing. The, this couple came to me after seeing a fertility specialist. They were, they were told that, um, or the woman was told that she needed to get down to a BMI of 35. So I think her BMI was around 40, 42 from memory. And, um, and the fertility specialist essentially said, listen, we, we, would, we would prefer to start treatment once you've lost some weight um, because of the health of the baby. So in terms of that genetic programming and being able to bring a baby to full term. Um, but also that whole genetic programming and, and epigenetic phenomenon 
So trying to make sure that the baby's not only healthy throughout pregnancy and, and in the first couple of years of life, but also all the way into adulthood, right? So yeah. they came to me, they, they used their initiative and thought, all right, let's go see a dietitian. And so the fertility specialist referred them over to me. And I worked with these, these guys, uh, most, mostly the woman, for about six or so sessions. And we worked on, obviously, weight loss, but she was living with PCOS, polycystic ovarian syndrome. So she had insulin resistance. So it made her, her weight loss journey to date very, very frustrating because she's essentially playing on a, on a different playing field to, to the average Joe out there yeah. or Joanne, I should say. Yeah. Um, yeah. So PCOS is a completely different story. You can't just rely on calorie counting and energy in, energy out. It's multifactorial. So I saw she'd been battling with her weight for years, as many women with PCOS do. And um, and she's she's come along and I've said, how about we not how about we not focus on weight here? I know you've got a target to to get down to a BMI of 35. However, why don't we why don't we pivot? and focus on something else that will probably provide some weight loss, um, but it'll certainly make you a lot healthier. And perhaps you might be able to naturally conceive without any fertility treatment. And so she was like, okay. So I think she was quite, she was buying into the fact. And, and so I met with her about six times, as I said, and um, we worked on increasing microbial diversity. So what that means is like diversity of bugs in your gut. And the what we bugs. know is microbial diversity is absolute key in terms of gut health. We also know that with more, a more diverse gut, that can actually help with things like insulin resistance and weight. In fact, they've taken the, um, they've taken the microbiome or the, or the bacteria, the microbiota out of a woman with PCOS put it into rats and the rats have developed PCOS like symptoms. So there's definitely a connection, right? Yeah. So anyway, we worked on, obviously there was a calorie consideration, which we worked on in, in terms of serving. So it wasn't stressful having to enter all these figures into my fitness pal and doing all yes. that kind of stuff. She ended up losing 10% of her body weight. Amazing. And yeah. guess what happened? What? She didn't have to see the fertility specialist. Yay, she fell pregnant. She fell pregnant. She avoided gestational diabetes. Nice. Yeah. And she brought a beautiful baby all the way to term. And, and I got to meet I got to meet her little daughter, which was oh, pretty cool. Awesome. And there's, so there's a number of really great things about that, right? So the first thing is, yeah, I'm an IVF doctor. <laughs> so you've just done me out of business. But Sorry. in all honesty... <laughs> we want nothing more than for our patients to fall spontaneously pregnant. Like we know how hard that assisted reproduction journey is. We also know that pregnancy outcomes are never quite as good in IVF as they are in spontaneous pregnancies. So that's the first thing is you've set her up for a great pregnancy outcome. Secondly, you've set her up for a great pregnancy devoid of those complications. Diabetes leads to big babies, leads to neonatal nursery admissions, leads to cesarean deliveries. Like you have helped her avoid all of those things as well as the epigenetic programming of that next generation where we know that, you know, two out of three babies born to a woman with GDM will become diabetic themselves. So look at what you've done, Nick. Amazing. Well, was, was, it, was it me? <laughs> was it just luck? Um, I know, obviously, I think diet, I'm biased, but I think diet has such a huge impact. Yeah, totally. So do I. <laughs> That's an awesome story. I love that. Do you have another one to share? Yeah, uh, I've, I also had a really great experience with another with another patient out of womb. Actually, um, she's come to me stressed, tired, fatigued, abdominal discomfort and cramping. Uh, recent diagnosis of endometriosis, like probably about eighteen months prior to seeing me. Um, I guess episodes of vomiting as well, just really painful periods. Obviously, the endometriosis is at the at the core of all of this, and um, and so we started working together on. Well, 
I was, when I see, let me start that again. When I see patients that are living with endometriosis, I'm thinking, all right, so is it gut health related? Is, is it is it actually affecting bowel movements? And are those symptoms coming at the end of the month or are they all throughout the whole month? There's so many considerations and there's so many variations on endometriosis. So an anti-inflammatory approach is always a good idea for endometriosis. However, that anti-inflammatory approach, which usually is really high in fiber, can actually exacerbate symptoms of endometriosis as well, the gut-related symptoms. So it's a really, really tricky area to navigate. Because she was stressed and fed up and she'd absolutely had enough, she put on a lot of weight. She stopped yes. exercising and she stopped caring about what she ate. And she got to the point where she was at ground zero. She came to see a talk that I was doing on, on a different topic. <laughs> and, uh, and we got talking at the, at the end of the presentation. And uh, I told her about my endometriosis um, program and how it involves, you know, six sessions over the course of 12 weeks. Uh, because I can give anybody a diet plan. Yeah. And like once I've provided the diet plan, I think there is just so much value in working alongside my patients yes. to to make sure that what they what they set out to do remains a priority for them and life doesn't get in the way. Yes. Cuz I see when yeah. I when I see my patients like um you know, I might see a patient today and then maybe I might see them in January and then maybe I might see them in in, I don't know, April or something like that. Life always gets in the way of, yep. of trying to establish a foundation for healthy eating. Um, but don't get me wrong, I've, I have people that have been able to actually nail it after one session. So I put together this program knowing that I wanted to coach people through uh, their condition, in particular endometriosis. And by the way, I've also got a PCOS program too. We'll talk about um, that in a minute. But yeah, finish okay. your story. And, uh, and so we started with an anti-inflammatory approach. And I thought, all right, do you, I said to her, do you mind being a crash test dummy? Let's see whether the high fiber, uh, high diversity of food intake, make, mostly plant-based, let's see if it exacerbates your symptoms. Because if it doesn't, we're on the money. And guess yeah. what? It didn't exacerbate her symptoms. In fact, it improved them significantly. She was reporting like within two weeks, she was reporting like a 50% improvement in abdominal discomfort, in nausea. In, she felt like she had so much more clarity from a mental point of view. Yeah. Um, and her bowel movements really improved. And I thought, all right, we're on a winner. So we obviously worked on improving that over time. And I thought, all right, I think I could almost discharge this patient halfway through the program because I'm liking what I'm hearing. I'm liking what I'm seeing. Um, she lost about five kilos in, in about a month, which was yeah. really impressive. Um, and her symptoms have improved, but then life got in the way. So she got really, really stressed at work. And I was like, ha, this is why I've got a program because I help these people, these patients of mine, ride all the bumps of life yeah. to a certain degree, from a nutrition point of view at least. And, um, and sure enough, we had to start talking about uh, emotional eating and relationship okay. with food and this whole other component. So we were focusing on anti-inflammatory uh, diet, Mediterranean-based diet with focus on gut health and everything was going swimmingly. But then the proverbial, you know what, hit the you know what. And we had to start entertaining the idea of more of the psychology around eating. Yeah. And so she learnt, this patient of mine, learnt how to control her emotions so that she wouldn't go mm -hmm. towards undesirable food choices. She was just using which, distract. Yeah, which and those undesirable food choices then leading to exacerbating her pain symptoms, which then would suppress the mood. And all of a sudden you're on that roller coaster, aren't you? Yeah, 100% correct. And on the odd occasion where she did succumb to um, those undesirable food choices, let me tell you, her body told her all about it because yeah. it got used to what it was like on the other side, the healthy yeah. side. Yeah. yeah. So, so there was a wisdom. Thing. There was a wisdom in that journey as well, Nick. Learning about your disease and how to live with your disease. Yep. Exactly. Yeah. 
Yeah. Amazing. So, so your endometriosis program goes for about six weeks. It's somewhat individualised, I would imagine, depending on what their symptoms are, but there are some key components around anti-inflammatory foods. Yep, yep. Anti-inflammatory focus, a gut health focus, which uh, most of the time they're very similar, so you don't feel like you have to work on too much. It kind of kills two birds with one stone. Um, I've revised the program, so now it goes for 10 weeks, mm -hmm. and, um, <laughs> and it involves a, a proper nutrient analysis from some computer software, so we can really find the gaps. Um, I mean, I, I trust my eyesight and my knowledge quite, quite well, but it's nice to have that back up. Yeah. Um, I've got, I've got a, a body composition scale, so we can measure things like visceral fat. I provide an anti-inflammatory meal plan. Um, and I think one of the strengths of the program compared to what it would be like if you were to come and visit me, you know, appointment after appointment, book as you go, is that there's unlimited email support. Um, I'm checking in with my patients on a weekly basis. You know, what, what are the highs? What are the lows? What do we need to work on? And then provide further support in that, in that way. Yeah. And I love the fact that it's asking somebody to make that longer term commitment to their health, that you're not, it's not like just taking a pill and it'll all be fixed. You know, it is something that you're going to have to commit some time to. And so by offering it to them as a sort of package, um, I think it starts to set that expectation for patients that this is going to be a journey of recovery, not a moment of recovery, which That's is it. great. Love that. Yeah. And listen, tell us about your PCOS package. What does that entail? What sort of time does that uh, require? What do they get from you for that, apart from the successful yep. management of PCOS? Yeah. yeah, so the PCOS program is very similar to the Endo one in that you get that weekly check-in, that coaching in between sessions. Um, it is a 10-week program as well. But it's more f targeting into you know, the symptoms of PCOS, which, funny enough, gut health is a really novel way of treating PCOS. As I said before, with my um, with my story about the lady who was able to conceive naturally, um, we look at supplements. Like, <laughs> I don't know about you, Tamara, but have you ever had a PCOS patient walk into your room and you've heard some shaking of like? I think it's just bottles. limited to PCOS patients, Nick. <laughs> I think, and, and you know that I think that comes. And most of the guys who are on here and listening to you would would agree. Um, everybody wants to know how to empower themselves. I, I don't think there's a person out there that doesn't say, you know, what can I do? What can I do to empower my situation? And so, um, you know, the 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 internet can be a blessing and it can be a curse. Um, and so the confusion, uh, I would imagine you would spend a lot of time working through that confusion with them. If I had a dollar for every time someone said, I tried to sort this out myself looking on the internet and it's just confusing. It's, there's so many different points of view. It's polarizing. It, yeah. I don't know what to do. I feel even more lost than I was beforehand. Yeah. 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 So it's, committing, it's... committing to a program, I, I, generally like to think that after the 10 weeks um and mind you i've seen people pass programs as well uh because they like that ongoing support but i reckon after that 10 weeks i can put most people in the right direction point them in the right direction and i'll be listening to what they're saying it'll just be music to my ears and i'll have confidence that they'll be able to go forth be healthy themselves be able to manage their condition um, but also potentially from a fertility point of view, absolutely enhance their chances of conceiving. Yeah, and that's enhanced their chances either spontaneously or even in, say, an IVF program. I certainly that's know there right. was a patient a couple of years ago that you and I worked with. Actually, it was a couple, patient couple that we worked mm. with together. And, of course, um, from my perspective, it was about uh, weight loss, but it was also about just improving the quality of their gametes, their eggs and their sperm. Um, and they went from having a really poor IVF outcome to an, an unbelievable IVF outcome um, just by really making those changes in their lifestyles. So the ability for you to work together with the IVF specialist to help improve 
their um, ART outcomes, I think is just an added bonus. So, hey, Nick, we've got a couple of questions on here mm -hmm. before we uh, tell people where they can find you and your packages and your programs. Um, and look, these are questions, I think they're actually really valuable questions. So, um, where is the first one? Brianna Jean, um, this is great. Are there any certain times during a cycle when it's okay to eat a bit of junk food or chocolate? <laughs> when is it not okay to eat chocolate? <laughs> Are I there love times that. in a cycle when it's okay? It's always okay, right? That would be my yeah. answer. Yeah, okay. like that, that's, yeah. So I think there's no bad food end of story Pass. there's no yeah, bad no. food it's it's just more the the frequency of which you you eat certain foods um so i'm gonna say no there's this there's always a good time to have those those types of snacks or undesirable foods but it really just depends on the balance like if yeah, it's uh you wouldn't have a whole block of cadbury chocolate you just have a a couple of pieces or you know you'd go for like your 70 70 percent cacao and maybe you wouldn't have it every night after dinner you'd just have it once or 80 percent 90 percent but you know 85. what i mean like <laughs> the yeah. answer is fairly in my mind is fairly self-explanatory would that be right yeah I, and I, I think it also depends on the person too and, and what the rest of their diet looks like but yeah there's definitely room for let's call them discretionary style foods um <laughs> are they the red ones <laughs> actually no the red ones alcohol uh, -uh. and smoking no, no. but everything no. else yeah <laughs> yeah a little hey, bit of chocolate well, here and there you've maybe got a even a friend burger every now and then <laughs> you've got a little friend oh, behind you i do <laughs> love it love a naked child <laughs> can you please go away <laughs> never work with with animals and children hey nicole harris Hi there. If we're hoping to be pregnant in the first half of 2023, is there anything we should be doing with prenatals and diet now? Well done, Nicole, for thinking about it. So, Nick, this is that classic, what can I do? Fantastic. Okay. Um, so you need a three-month runway for, from an epigenetic point of view. So, you know, anything... Like there's a lot of studies that suggest uh, in terms of epigenetics to get the lifestyle factors um, all aligned and, and humming nicely a month before conception. But there's also some some evidence suggesting three months. So great that you've got a runway, as I like to call it. Um, a lot of the time I'll see a patient and we'll be going, it'll be the first time I meet them and we'll, they will be doing, IV, they'll be doing IVF. So um Great runway. I well, it depends on the diet, but um, I think a, a prenatal would be a great idea. Um, tr doing many, many nutrition analyses over the years, including on myself, it's really hard to meet your recommendations on mm. a daily basis. Like you really have to put some effort in, even if you're the food police. So having that little top up of a prenatals can be quite quite beneficial um there's obviously a whole bunch of different ones out there and i'd suggest that you talk to your health professional about which one because you can actually match a prenatal to you know depending on the person's diet so if someone was low in iron or um if someone needed no iron you know that kind of stuff if someone was at more at higher risk of um neural tube defects or something like that so there, there are many different prenatals out there so talk to yeah. your health professional before you choose one yeah. um and then i would just make sure that i got my mediterranean based meal pattern nice and solid and getting some consistency um because you know when you fall pregnant other things start to happen like morning yeah. sickness so yeah. you've really got to build up your nutrients, particularly the ones that you hang on to and you don't just pee out in the toilet. Um, yeah. But you also want to establish some habits as well. If you get those habits going, like the sky's the limit, you'll A, probably have a better pregnancy, B, probably have a better um, better lactation and breastfeeding and, and you'll be able to set an example for your child. 
Mm. And trust me, they watch everything. <laughs> you they do, do. They including do. when you're on Instagram Live. Yeah. <laughs> so I definitely think um, whatever prenatal you choose, it has to have folic acid in it, uh, mm. a minimum of um, five milligrams. Uh, sorry, five micrograms. Five, uh, 500 micrograms. Um, yep. And you're right, if there's an increased risk of neutral de defects, up it to five milligrams. Um, so I think that's really important. And if you're in an iodine deficient area, um, then it really should have iodine in it. But you're right, all the other things is going to be very, very individualized. And I love that you said Mediterranean diet um, from my readings as well. I'm, I'm glad I'm, right. I'm sort of correct on that, that it seems that it's the Mediterranean diet that is uh, the most conducive to fertility. So, um, so that's really good. So there you go, Nicole Harris. I hope you were taking notes from the master there. Um, now, who else is us? Ashley McKenna. Oh, the sugar story. Are there any impacts of sugar consumption on sex hormones? So that would be like estrogen, progesterone, testosterone, and egg and sperm quality. Hell Big question. Yeah. <laughs> Hell yeah. Hell yeah is my is my answer, but obviously it's going to depend on how much. Yeah. 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 So if you're a two litres of coke a day type person versus, say, the odd little bit of dark chocolate maybe every other night, then there's a big difference between those two. So, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah it definitely can have a, a real impact on hormones and um, egg and sperm quality for sure. Yeah. And would you say that you sort of process sugars, simple sugars are much more problematic than, say, your complex carbs? Yeah. 100%. Good. Excellent. Yep. Yeah, love it. Okay. Oh, life of Kate. Now, this is interesting. I know nothing about this. I recently had DNA tests for diet that said I had mutations for gluten, dairy, and fructose. I would imagine that would be some measure of intolerance. She's what Life of Kate maybe is asking about. Mm. What are your thoughts on the validity of those DNA tests? She has well, I know you can, get, you can get a celiac gene test which will at least lead you down the path and, and, uh, and help your medical professional try and determine what the next steps are. It's not diagnostic. Um, yeah, I, I can't say that I know much about the validity, but by the sounds of it, probably not something that I would be advising at this stage. But no. I think maybe <clears throat> sometime down the track, those types of tests will actually be a lot more accurate, potentially more robust, more credible. I mean, we're certainly doing, we're certainly looking at genomes of say, you know, endometrium, we're doing endometrial genomes, vaginal genomes. Um, so we, we, you know, the whole concept of, of your genetic potential for things, but there's always that interaction with environment, isn't there? And yeah. so to, to just, particularly in these multigenic things, it would be very difficult to say, um, you know, if you had a mutation, and to be honest, I don't know how you would determine that, but if you had a mutation in your ability to process gluten, dairy, and, and fructose, um, yeah, no, no, I don't know how you would test, confirm, and what's the pathology you're measuring? Are you measuring a, a gut permeability issue? Are you measuring a miscarriage issue? Are you measuring a fertility issue? Like, where's the relevance? What's the outcome of, of mm. interest? So I would always take those kind of gross testing things with a bit of a grain of salt, to be honest, like Kate. Um, can I, and can I just... I've not, it's not in the mainstream medicine arena. So when, every, when anything's a little bit peripheral and fringe, I'd, be, um, I'd be, be a little bit suspect as to its clinical application. Can I just add something to that, Tamara? Yeah. Um, I think that any test like that that's that's going to encourage somebody to decrease their food selection is dangerous mm -hmm. um, from, a, from a variety point of view. Um, I would hate for my patients to be cutting out gluten unnecessarily, cutting out dairy unnecessarily, yeah. cutting out yeah. fructose unnecessarily. And uh, unfortunately, there's a lot of tests out there that people take and Unfortunately, that's the end result. And then they'll come and see somebody like me and I'll be like, well, no, you, you probably don't have to do that. But let's explore that further. 
with some food challenges and things like that. And all those those tests sound very um, very FODMAP like or yeah. or like related to some of those high FODMAP foods. So there's certainly a lot of science around the low FODMAP diet and its reintroduction and working out a more personalized diet. Yeah. 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 I would say we have to watch this space and um, yeah, I, I, I haven't seen anything like that in clinical application in the world of, of reproductive medicine. So I'm just not sure of its validity. All right. Did anybody else? Ask? I thought that was a really good question to mm. life of Kate for asking. I hope you, she stayed on to hear the answer. Oh, here's <laughs> another one. Rana Murad, Nick, do you work with PCOS patients who are also athletes and need to eat for performance in a weight limited sport? Great question, Rana. <laughs> Certainly do. I'm a accredited sports dietitian as well. I know you, you're so skilled. It's incredible. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Definitely. Yeah, and in fact, there. that that is quite a challenge, isn't it? Particularly with athletes, because there is nutritional requirements. Um, there is calorie requirements. And then if you're then throwing in the, well, I'm also a woman uh, who has reproductive requirements, you know, there's that classic athlete triad where some women will lose their periods because they're probably in a bit of a calorie deficit or their, mm. their energy requirements are so high that they just shut off their reproductive axis completely because it's non-essential um, according to the body because <laughs> they're, <laughs> they're in performance mode, mode, not reproduction mode. So, yeah, that would yeah. be quite a challenging um, space to be in. I'd love to help out. That would be, that'd be great to, to help yeah. you out there. Yeah, well, Rana, you know where to find him. <laughs> you can find him at Womb. <laughs> um, oh, yes, Nicole said she took some notes, which is good. Yes, Life of Kate, you were listening. Um, Great, fantastic. You can always go back and listen to this. They're, they're all the questions that people have posed, Nick. That's um, there's some really great food for thought there. Excuse the pun. Where can uh, <laughs> where can people find you? Where can they find you? Well, obviously, there's Womb in West Perth. Yeah. Um, but if you're listening from interstate or, or overseas, I can certainly do telehealth consultations as well. So, um, yeah, there's, there's no barriers um, in this day and age, is there? Oh, no, um, no, no. We're guns at telehealth now. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Where so, can yeah, they find you on socials? And you can find me at Nick Nutrition Nation um, on Insta and on Facebook. And you have a website? www.nutritionnation.com.au. Beautiful. That sounds fantastic. I don't think there were any more questions. Oh, Maddie Post. Good on you, Maddie. Any particular food groups, vitamins, minerals that particularly stimulate reproductive hormones or just a balanced diet in general? Vitamin D. Any particular... Oh, say again. Vitamin D. Yeah, in addition to your Mediterranean a diet. well-balanced Mediterranean-based meal pattern. Yeah. So can just give us an idea what you mean by Mediterranean-based pattern so they don't go and Google it. <laughs> we want to get them off Google. <laughs> Nuts and seeds, oily fish like salmon and trout and tuna, Spanish mackerel, things like that. Uh, obviously, fruit and vegetables is, is a, a core to the Mediterranean-based meal pattern. And then your lean meats and, and chickens and things like that. Beautiful. Legumes. Yeah. Yeah. Um, very hard to kind of conceptualize that into like breakfast, lunch, and dinner. Yeah. Um, and, and everyone's going to be different, but uh, yeah, it's, it's a, that's what I do. So fantastic. That's awesome. Yeah. So come and see Nick for an individualized little management plan. If you're wanting to set that up. Wonderful. Thank you so much. Um, I learned some stuff there too. Um, and it's been an absolute pleasure working with you over the last couple of years. I know that you've certainly contributed to the lives of um, many of my patients and patient couples. And, yes, uh, you can find Nick at Womb um, and working in the fertility space and also in the um, just general reproductive health space as well. So thanks, guys, for joining us. Nick, thank you for jumping on. Thank you to your son for uh, making a little cameo. <laughs> <laughs> love Why it me? That is great. <laughs> yeah yeah love the juggle <laughs> have yeah. a beautiful uh, rest of your week as we wrap up fertility nutrition month 
And uh, guys, look after yourselves and we'll see you on the flip side. See ya. See ya. Thanks, T.